Welcome to another installment of the Astro 310 video series. Today's video will be discussing the classical orbital elements, or COEs. We have two goals. The first is to recognize why the R and V vectors and COEs both accurately describe an orbit, and to know why COEs are preferred. And secondly, we're hoping to list and characterize the meaning of each COE. The R vector, when described in the GEC frame, points from the center of the Earth to our satellite's position. However, our satellite's not static overhead. When we consider multiple R vector positions as they change with time, we can build a V vector, or velocity vector, to describe its motion. The V vector will point in the direction of spacecraft motion and will be tangent to the orbital path. Using the R vector and the V vector, it's possible to describe the spacecraft's current position. However, even with this current description, it's difficult to imagine what the overall orbit looks like just from these two 3D vectors. For this task, we rely on Kepler. Kepler developed the classical orbital elements, or COEs, to describe the orbit's size, shape, and orientation, and the spacecraft's place within them. Our size will be described by our sigma major axis. Our shape will be given by E, or eccentricity. Our orientation will be given by three separate angles. Our inclination, our right ascension of the sending node, or capital omega, or, and then our argument of perigee, or little omega, will define our swivel. And then lastly, we have our spacecraft's position within the orbit, which is given by nu, or true anomaly. First, let's talk about the sigma major axis. The sigma major axis is half of the major, or long, axis of our orbit. It's the size of our orbit. It's given in units of kilometers, and it can have a range of values. Uh, if we have a circle on our ellipse, it's a positive value. If we have a parabola, it's equal to infinity. And for an hyperbola, it's actually less than zero, or a negative number. This is what it looks like for our orbit's sigma major axis to change. Our eccentricity, which describes the shape of our orbit, is actually unitless, but it can have a range of values. For a circle, our eccentricity, or E, is equal to zero. For an ellipse, it can, va it can vary between zero and one. For a parabola, it's exactly equal to one, and for a hyperbola, it's greater than one. This is what it looks like for our eccentricity to change. Next, we have our inclination, which is our first of our orientation parameters. The inclination, or I, defines the tilt of the orbit. It's defined as the angle between K and H. K points is a vector that points from Earth's center to the North Pole, and H is the specific angular momentum vector, which defines our orbital plane. Its units are in degrees, and its range of values can be between 0 and 180. If you look on our equation sheets, you'll actually find its definition explicitly here. It's given as the cosine I is equal to the uh, k vector dotted with the h vector over the magnitude of the k times the h vector. This is what it looks like for orbital inclination to change. Note the difference between the k and the h vector is what defines our inclination. Next, we have the right ascension of the ascending node, or capital omega. This defines the twist of our orbit. This is the angle uh, between I and N. I points from the Earth's center to the vernal equinox, and N is our nodal vector, which points from the Earth's center to the ascending node. This is measured in the equatorial plane eastward. Its units are given in degrees, and it can have a range of values between 0 and 360. On the equation sheet, its definition is right there underneath that of the inclination. Uh, but being between the ran angle is between i and n over the magnitude of i and n. This is what it looks like for our right ascension of the sending node angle to change.
Next, we have the argument of perigee, which defines the swivel of our, or of our orbit. It's the angle between n and e. It's measured in the orbital plane in the direction of satellite motion. Its units are given in degrees, and they can have a range of values between 0 and 360. n, again, is our nodal vector, which points from Earth's center to the ascending node, and e is our eccentricity vector, which points from Earth's center to perigee. The definition of this uh, particular angle is given, again, on our equation sheet right beneath that of RAN. The cosine of the argument of perigee equals the nodal vector dotted with the eccentricity vector over the magnitude of those two vectors multiplied together. Here's what it looks like for our argument of perigee to change. Lastly, we have our true anomaly, which defines our satellite position within our orbit. The angle position between E and R is that of true anomaly. It's measured in the orbital plane in the direction of satellite motion. Its units are given in degrees and can have a range of values between 0 and 360. The eccentricity vector E points from Earth's center to perigee, and R points from Earth's center to the satellite position. Lastly, the relationship between E and R is given as true anomaly on our equation sheet shown here. Here's what it looks like for a true anomaly to change in our orbit. In summation, we have six classical orbital elements which help us visualize our orbit. Our size is A, given in semi, as the semi-major axis. Our shape is defined as E, or our eccentricity. Our orientation is defined by three angles, our inclination, or I, our right ascension and ascending node, or capital omega, our argument of perigee, or lowercase omega, and finally, our satellite position within that orbit as the true anomaly, nu. Thanks. See you next time.